Good evening. Just uh, a few more practical announcements. Can you all hear me? All right. Good. At 6.55, the uh, live stream goes live with the, the, uh, the scene or the, the, the announcement of the, of the lecture. And at, at 6.59, it will go live. And so we'll have to have, ask everyone to not block the main aisle. The, the line of sight of the camera, okay? And then at 6.59, at 7, then I'll begin with the uh, introductions. So you have a minute or two to get some more wine or water or cookies. <laughs> Why all the smoke grenades you do back there? Well, I used to smoke a lot. I used to smoke like two packs a day. You ready? Let's say no, you say it's good. Yeah. Say it's a lead. I'd rather do like a, like one, like, like one a day or something like that. So far, it's just usually in the night when I can't really go to sleep. It's just going. No, I'll buy them. I'll buy them. Such a waste. Yes. But then I rather, I rather, I rather smoke all of his first and then give him the last hit to the edge. That's what we do. I'll be like, this is light one, and then I just hit the one or two drags, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Please take your places. Good evening. I'm Father Michael Hilbert, Associate Pastor of the Church of St. Ignatius Loyola in New York City. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all, those here present, numerous in Wallace Hall, and those who join us via live stream. Welcome to the inauguration of our parish lecture series for 2023. On behalf of the pastor, Father Dennis Yesolona, and our entire parish community, I greet you with heartfelt best wishes and a warm welcome. The theme of this year's lecture series is Blessed Are the Peacemakers. Tonight and in the four lectures that will follow on a monthly basis, we will engage in a reflection on the urgent and one might say elusive task and mission of peacemaking. And to guide us in these reflections, we have invited a number of distinguished 
committed and credible peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. What Jesus calls good and whom Jesus calls blessed is striking because his values seem to be upside down from our own. Many affirm this blessing with their lips, but in tumultuous times, we have tended toward the pragmatism of the fight. It is not too bold to say there is a great deal of conflict to go around. And the question we consider tonight is how we Christians and all people of goodwill should respond to this. We want to take Jesus' words seriously. If a peacemaker is to be called a child of God, then we should want to be one. To be one, however, will take some work. The beauty of this compound word is that it mashes up the word peace with the word for doing or practicing. It is active. There are three elements that we must keep in mind. The first is that the peacemakers must be committed. Peacemaking is not just being nice. Peacemaking may be kind, but it is not passive. It demands that we step into conflict. The peacemaker initiates reconciliation when others have wronged them. The peacemaker is quick to repent when they have wronged others. The peacemaker knows there is no peace without healing, and there is no healing without tough conversations and work. Second, the peacemakers must be committed to the truth. As tensions among us ramp up, so, do, so does the use of deception and falsity and hypocrisy. We lob attacks and insults at our rivals, making the other side into caricatures who are ignorant or gullible or evil. The trouble is, the attacks and insults are almost always untrue in whole or in part. We engage in warfare by passing on false quotes and false statistics and exaggerated claims and stereotypes all to prop up our side. We denigrate the truth. Think about all that is relevant to peace that depends on truth. Justice, reconciliation, accountability, trust, humility, and love all evaporate in the absence of the truth. To achieve true effective peacemaking, one must be committed to seeking and speaking the truth. And third and finally, the pursuit of meaningful relationships is essential to peacemaking. Relationships help us to see the humanity on the other side. Many of our divides exist because we do not actually know one another. Tonight's lecture is entitled, When the Wave Knows It's the Ocean, Apostolic Wholeness and the Kinship of God. Our speakers are Jesuit Father Greg Boyle, the founder and director of Homeboy Industries, along with two of his homies, Misael Velasco and Alberto Blando. These Misael and Alberto will speak first, and then they will pass the microphone to Father Greg. And after the lecture, there will be time for questions. And there are always light refreshments to enjoy at the back of the room. Finally, I would like to acknowledge a parishioner of St. Ignatius Loyola, whose generosity has made this evening's lecture possible, Mr. Felipe Proper. Felipe, please stand and let us thank you. So now Alberto and Misael 
we are eager to learn from you lessons of commitment and truth and kinship in your good work of peacemaking. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Alberto Blando. I'm here with Homeboy Industries, a nonprofit organization that helps youth and gang members rehabilitate themselves and become contributing members of society all over again. Um, I'll tell you guys a little bit of something about myself. Um, I grew up in the Boyle Heights area. I grew up in a single parent household. You know, at a very young age, we were brought up in an environment where um, gang violence was always around us and it was embedded in us, you know. At 16, I lost my older brother due to gang violence. At that, at that moment, I made up my mind that I was gonna join the gang, that I was gonna join the gang. I didn't, at the, mom, at the time, I didn't know what I was joining. I knew that I was just trying to fill a void in my life. And that void was filled by homies, whether it was them giving me drugs, guns, take me to go do things that I didn't want to do, you know? But that's how we grew up, you know? I was in the system. I met, happened to meet Father Gregory Boyle along the way. You know, he opened his doors, his heart, and gave me a second chance and opportunity at life. You know, without him, I'll be dead or in prison. You know, and I'm glad that I, had, that I met him because without him, that wouldn't be here speaking to you guys representing our company. Um, I've been there for on and off for 10 years. It's not my first time. I've committed mistakes along the way, and it's always had his doors open for me. Um, I don't know, I just try not to get emotional talking about it because, you know, it just bring, brings back emotions that I don't want to bring up, you know, and through him I learned that hope, compassion, how to treat other people, you know. I'm in an 18-month program right now. They're teaching me, right now I'm gonna be in the cafe, I'm gonna be a prep cook. I've never done that before, but it's an experience. You know, I'm fully embracing it. And yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say. I'm just kind of starstruck that I'm here speaking to you guys, you know. I don't know if Father Greg was telling us from the beginning that to write something down and memorize something, and I was just gonna go from the heart, you know. That's what he taught us, you know. So we have tattoos on the heart, we have scars, open wounds, and you know, it's a pleasure knowing you, Father Greg. I appreciate everything you guys do for us, and I appreciate you guys. You guys have a good night. Hi everyone, my name is Misael Velasco. Um, just tell you a little bit about myself. I also grew up in a single parent household. I actually grew up with Beto here. We've been knowing each other since we were one, two years old. Um, we grew up in a very, very tough environment. Like he said, gangs were always all around us. Um, his mom, my mom were practically never there, so we looked out for each other. We looked out for our little brothers, our little sisters. And just at a certain age, you, you already know you're going to become a gang member. Those are the people that are looking out for you. Um, a lot of people ask, well, why would you join a gang? Um, there's nothing good that comes out of it. But there's been nights when you know you're there, and how are you not going to have you know, that person's back or your other friends back and be there for them when, you know, there's times where you guys have no food, your moms are not there, and that's the person you're sharing a sandwich with. So all of that, how he said, is embedded in us. We grew up together, so obviously we're going to be from the same place. But I paroled from prison um, late 2019. Beto told me to join Homeboys and... I'm glad I did. It changed my life, and how he said Father Greg gave us a second chance, and he's, he's an amazing human being, and he's helped out so many people. 
and it's it's crazy how personal he gets with each individual. It's not like he's sending you to someone else or even when he's out on his trips, you see him texting back other people that are texting him, answering phone calls. And God has blessed us, you know, with him in our life and with everyone else that joins Homeboys because it's, it's a hard road to, to go straight after everything, everything that you've been through. But I thank God that I'm able to stand here now and talk to you guys and to be able to be thankful for everything that Father Greg has done and everything else he does for everybody else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your welcome. And uh, it's an, uh, we'll have more time during the question and answer. You can uh, pepper them with uh, uh, things and questions. And uh, it, it's the privilege of my life to know uh, Beto and Misael, and the day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I'm closer to God than these two gentlemen. We've had a really good time in your fair city. Now, I was in this room before. I, was, uh, I texted a homie who was with me. Uh, I said, hey, when did we speak at St. Ignatius? And he said it was 2009. And it was myself and Luis Perez and a homie named Joe Escamilla. And uh, Luis grew up in, in uh, the Bronx, ever had his childhood in the Bronx, was born in the Bronx, and then moved to LA. And then Joe had never been to New York uh, city, a big, huge guy, uh, had never been on a plane. And so we were about to land at Kennedy, and uh, so, and Joe was at the window, looking out the window. I said, hey, Joe, what's, what's on your bucket list of, you know, places to see in New York? And, and uh, he was very excited. He said, well, first, you know, the Statue of Liberty and uh, the Empire State Building, <laughs> you know, and of course, the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> and Lewis very kindly and gently said, fool, that's in Paris. And he turned and looked at Lewis and he said, well, I guess I'll scratch it off my list then. He said, <laughs> um, it, Lewis was, uh, uh, he liked giving these talks. And so um, he, uh, we were uh, having dinner shortly after that trip, as I recall. And and it was just the two of us, we were having dinner, and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly, you know, and, and he said, you know, you got to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> and I said, yeah, no shit, that's, uh, <laughs> that is some good advice right there. You know, uh, th th I was signing some books before, and, uh, and thank you for buying my most recent book, uh, The Whole Language, you know, I was on a plane and I was returning to my seat uh, from the restroom and, and there was somebody on the aisle and they had the, the, the tray table down and had a book open and I could see the distinctive turquoise uh, color of the cover of my book, The Whole Language. I went, oh my God, somebody's reading my book. And so I started to be kind of low pro and I was walking by and I looked at the guy, <laughs> knocked out, I believe he was drooling. So apparently reading my books is the next best thing to CPAP machine or something. <laughs> so that's all the self-defecating I'm going to do for tonight. You know, uh, the theme of the whole uh, you know, series is uh, Blessed Are the Peacemakers, and of course that comes from um, the Beatitudes, and so we're used to Blessed Are the Single-Hearted, and Blessed Are uh, Those Who Show Mercy, and Blessed Are the Peacemakers. And actually the original translation of that was uh, not blessed, but you're in the right place if. You're in the right place if you show mercy. You're in the right place if you're single-hearted. You're in the right place if you're a peacemaker. So um, 
it's not so much a spirituality, but it's a geography. It tells you where to stand. And so we are invited to stand with a particularity. We're invited as uh, disciples to stand at the margins because that's the only way they ever will get erased. If you stand out at them, you can look under your feet and see that that's in fact what's happening. And you stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. And you stand with those whose dignity has been denied and those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And every once in a while, you get to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out and you get to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And you, in fact, get to stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And you stand there, and of course, as authentic disciples, you have to brace yourself because people will accuse you of wasting your time out at the margins. And the prophet Jeremiah writes, for in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And I think in the end, none of that makes any damn sense, of course, except for the fact that the God we happen to have the God we actually have, uh, who loves us without measure and without regret, is inviting us to do precisely that, because um, that's where the joy is. That's why we're invited there. Not because it's the harder thing. The harder thing is just the harder thing. But this is the thing that kind of most resembles uh, Jesus. And so it's where we find our authentic uh, selves and consequently our authentic following. And so it's, uh, there's nothing more consequential in our lives than to uh, have a notion of God that's, that can meet the same kind of spacious invitation to stand out at the margins. Uh, Meister Eckhart, who's a, a theologian and a mystic who lived like 200 years uh, before St. Ignatius of Loyola, used to say that it is a lie, any talk of God that doesn't comfort you. And we don't really believe that because uh, all of us have settled in one way or another for a partial God who doesn't really uh, uh, always want that for us. But I think he's quite right. I had a spiritual director once who said to me, you know, we need a better God than the one we have. He was a Jesuit. Um, <laughs> but of course he's right, because uh, we've settled. Uh, you know, our notions of God are a little bit like our baby teeth. You're not opposed to them, but <laughs> you're going to move on from them. And it's important to do that. It's important to kind of uh, find the God that Jesus knew. My friend Mirabai Starr, who's a mystic and writes and translates mystics, uh, she says, once you know the God of love, you fire all the other gods. And I think that's an essential process in our own maturation as people who want to be authentic uh, disciples who want to take seriously what Jesus took seriously, which just happened to be four things. Inclusion, nonviolence, unconditional loving kindness, and compassionate acceptance. But we can't really move towards those things that Jesus took seriously unless what undergirds it is a notion of God that's really large and spacious and that we understand the tender one who invites us to tenderness. I remember I was uh, presiding at a mass at San Fernando Juvenile Hall, and it was in a big gym, 
and uh, it had like 500 folding chairs with 500 gang members sitting in them. And I was up on kind of a, a raised platform of some kind, and, and I was vested, so I was wearing my alb and my stole, and they had these little hojas, these sheets that had the readings in English and Spanish, and so, you know, rather than read along, I just closed my eyes, and you do that sometimes when you preside, and you want to just listen to the word of God being proclaimed. And so I had my eyes closed, and one at a time, the homies would get up, and the first guy did uh, the, the reading from the Hebrew Bible, and then a guy got up to do the responsorial psalm. And I don't know, I was de detecting an overabundance of confidence in his voice, and he gets up and he says, the Lord is exhausted. <laughs> and I said, what the hell? And it was, the Lord is exalted. <laughs> and I remember thinking at the time, wow, that's way better. <laughs> that, in fact, the exalted God is, is a projection, you know, let's face it. You know, if I was God, I would want to be exalted. But the exhausted God is probably closer to where we want to be. A God who is generous and tender, just as you are with your kids or just as you are with your grandchildren. That someone can say to you, you know, how was your weekend? Oh my gosh, I'm pooped. I had the grandkids over. But it's a good tired. And you know exactly the fullness of exhaustion and the generosity of a love that never stops loving. That's pretty close to the God we have. You know, I, I was, uh, ever since the pandemic, my, all my sibs, we have a Zoom once a month. We're going to have one this Sunday at uh, 4, every uh, once a month on a Sunday. And I, had, uh, I have five sisters and two brothers, and they're all married. And, and so, you know, we get on this Zoom, and it's, uh, you know, a lot of people. And, um, and so I remember we... Uh, not that long ago, it was a kind of the anniversary of my mom's death, and she had died, uh, I believe it was in the second year of the Trump uh, administration, and, and uh, she was smart as a tack, 92 years old, and uh, she watched so much MSNBC, she was becoming Rachel Maddow, and, <laughs> and my father had died 25 years ago, and... Uh, and she died the way you want to die, you know, in your own home and surrounded by your kids in your own bed. And she wasn't a lick afraid of dying. I, I remember about three weeks before she died, she was just positively giddy and, and exhilarated. And she said, I've never done this before, you know, <laughs> which was exactly something you might say just before skydiving. And and in fact, the day before she died, I remember I was uh, sitting at the foot of her bed, and she was asleep, and, and it's so, it was so rare to be there alone in the room with her, because it was always 93 people at any given time, and it was just the two of us, and, and she woke up, and she saw me sitting at the foot of her bed, and, and she said, oh, for crying out loud, and she went back to sleep. Well, she was pissed that she hadn't died, you know, and I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. And then the next day, as luck would have it, right at noon, I remember my sisters went out to get lunch or something, and, and I was there again alone, and, and at exactly at 12, she sits up. She opens her eyes. She lets out this wondrous, glorious gasp. <gasps> Skydiving. And then she left us. And no one in earshot of that sound could ever be afraid of death again. But I remember that, you know, in the last days of her life, she'd be in and out of consciousness, and there'd be two or four or all eight of her kids around her bed. And she would kind of, when she'd come to, she'd lock on to one of us. And she'd uh, just look at us. And with breathless delight, she'd say, you're here, you're here. 
And I remembered that when I buried her, I thought, I think that may well be the, the singular agenda item of our exhausted God, which is to look at us with great tenderness and say, you're here, you're here. And so we receive the tender glance and then we choose to become that tender glance in the world. And, and this is, uh, I think, what Thich Nhat Hanh means when he says, when the wave knows that it's the ocean, where you notice the notice of God, and then you choose to be that notice in the world. I, you know, I was, recently I was uh, channel surfing, and I came across the Dalai Lama being interviewed by the BBC, and I can't remember what the question was, but uh, at the point I jumped in, and he was answering something about authenticity of any religion. How, how, what's the mark and measure of it? And he paused, and he just put his hands on his chest, and he said, warm-heartedness and it's a clunky word in English one that we probably wouldn't use that much and the clunkiness serves us because it it forces you to slow it down a little bit warm heartedness and of course I, I knew exactly what he meant and it, even as he proceeded to explain it and use the word in his kind of clunky English, he, it was kind of had this dual meaning. It meant inner peace, which is to say, I think, discovering your true self and loving, and then wanting to go forth with a warm heartedness into the world. Tender glance tender glance. This is the only way to take seriously what Jesus took seriously, from peacemaking to single-heartedness to showing mercy. It's how it works. It's how we stay connected. At uh, Homeboy Industries, there, there are three Jesuits that work there. Uh, Frank Buckley, who a, a, has a doctorate in psychology, he's a therapist. Uh, Mark Torres, who's a, kind of a spiritual guru. He runs uh, meditation classes and stuff. And, and the homies don't know too much, uh, you know, like what a Jesuit is, you know, and uh, even though there are three of us there. And so I, 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 one day I remember I was sitting in my office, which is glass enclosed, and I can look out onto the floor of the reception area, which is quite, quite large at our headquarters. 10,000 gang members a year walk through our doors trying to reimagine their lives. And uh, as Beto mentioned, the 18-month training program. So it's healing-centered. And uh, so you want folks to uh, somehow uh, discover their true self and loving and then they become sturdy and resilient, and then they can leave us after 18 months, and the world will throw at them what it will, but this time they won't be toppled by it. So therapy and classes and anger management and case managers, navigators, we have 11 social enterprises. We're rival enemy gang members, make croissants together, you know. And so, uh, so I was sitting in my office, I had three people in front of my desk, and we have tours galore at Homeboy, people from all over the world, and, uh, and they, you know, we have a bunch of tour guides who have, you know, their kind of tour that they give, where they walk them through this huge headquarters in Chinatown in Los Angeles. And so I'm sitting there, and Osvaldo comes by, and he has like 20 people from somewhere, a high school or something, and uh, they're he's giving a tour, and they park right in front of my office, and it's one of those, you know, 
observe our founder in his natural habitat <laughs> kinds of moments. And, and I wave faintly and try to carry on this conversation with these three people in front of me. And, and, but he has what the homies would call a loud ass voice. And so he's extremely loud and he's saying, this is Father Greg Boyle. He's the founder of Homeboy Industries. He is a jujitsu priest. So from my perch, I, I did kind of some of my best moves. <laughs> Not at all impressive. So uh, on February 27th, 1544, St. Ignatius of Loyola enters for the very first time a word in his journal, in his spiritual diary. It's the first time he uses the word. And then he proceeds to use it quite a bit for the remaining 12 years of his life until he died. And before he died, he went back and he circled the word. And I speak Spanish, but I had never heard of the word before. And the word is acatamiento. Acatamiento. And it comes from kind of an archaic word, acatar, which means to look at something with attention. And Certainly it was born of a personal, mystical experience between Ignatius and his God. But he, he didn't want it to remain a moment. He wanted to turn it into a movement. And I don't mean the Society of Jesus. He wanted to turn it into this, this stance, much the same way that Jesus wanted us wanted us to be in the right place. That for Jesus, it was less important to take the right stand on issues and more important to stand in the right place. The same thing with Ignatius. Acatamiento, and it gets translated as affectionate awe, which is a magnificent translation because it's packed with all sorts of things, including the tender glance that comes from our God, including noticing the notice of God and then choosing to be that notice in the world. It is when the wave knows that it is the ocean. It is where the joy is. It is where the flourishing happens, right at that juncture, where you stand at the margins with affection at all. It was about a stance and not a private mystical moment between Ignatius and his God. And now 10,000 gang members a year walk through our doors. There are 120,000 of them in LA County. Our program isn't there for folks who need our help. It's only for those who want it. And every single one that walks through the doors comes barricaded behind a wall of shame and disgrace. And the only thing that can scale that wall is tenderness. Every single man, woman who walks through those doors on Alameda in Chinatown, each one comes with what psychologists would call a disorganized attachment. Mom was either frightened or frightening. And you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. And so they're greeted. The Buddhists say, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are, which is another way of saying acatamiento. It's another way of saying affectionate awe. Uh, the homies, because uh, so many of them have been locked up for really a long time. And they'll say, we're used to being watched, but we're not used to being seen. And so just like any vexing, complex social dilemma that faces us in any big city in our country, it requires that we, re that we set up and preserve a safe place where people can feel seen, and then they can feel cherished. 
if it's true that the traumatized are more likely to cause trauma, then it has to be true that the cherished will be able to find their way to the joy there is in cherishing themselves and others, which is to say, receive the tender glance and now become that tender glance in the world. Every homie who walks in that place is greeted by somebody who, in a sense, looks at him or her and says, you're here, you're here. And that's it. It's not about rescue, saving, fixing. You don't go to the margins to make a difference. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. If it's about making a difference, then it's, it's, a, it's about me if I do that, and it can't be about me. You know, a lot of the, our senior staff, we have like 150 senior staff, and they'll do that sometimes. You know, they'll say, I think I'm just burning out. I guess I'm just too compassionate. And I go, no, slow the roll here just a little bit, because it just means you've allowed it to become about you, and it can't. I was in Houston once, and I, uh, after a talk, I, a, a guy came up to me, a former gang member covered in tattoos, who was now working with gang members in the streets of Houston, and he really was quite earnest, and he was pleading with me, and he says, how do you reach them, meaning gang members? And I found myself saying, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? Can you receive who they are? Can you allow your heart to be altered? That's the only thing that's asked. Now, it feels passive, but in the end, what it's about is, is exquisite mutuality, where the two of you, as you do this, together in each other's presence, you inhabit uh, your own dignity and your own nobility in each other's presence. It's exquisitely mutual. And that's important. A at Homeboy, we're allergic to the idea of holding the bar up and asking homies to measure up, mainly because our exhausted God never does this with us. And so why would we do it with each other? Instead, we hold the mirror up and you tell people the truth. You tell them that they are exactly what God had in mind when God made them. And once they know that truth, they become that truth. They inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. I had a homie in my office the other day, Joseph, and I had buried his father 30 plus years ago. His father was a gang member and a heroin addict, and he um, died of an overdose. And Joseph became a gang member and a heroin addict and has had lots of bouts uh, living on Skid Row in Los Angeles. Now he's doing quite well, again, at uh, Homeboy. And we were having a conversation, and, and then uh, it was over, and we both stood, and, and he said, you know what life is all about? I said, no, tell me. And he said, it's about removing the blindfold. I said, I think you're right. But what do you see, Joseph, when you remove the blindfold? And like the Dalai Lama, he touched his heart and he said, goodness. And that's exactly right. I suspect if we knew these true two truths, that every single person is unshakably good, and as Mother Teresa 
reminds us that we belong to each other. I suspect we'd make progress from police brutality to dealing with homeless to any complex vexing dilemma that plagues us. But we're allergic to holding the bar up and it requires that we reach in and we dismantle messages of shame and disgrace that keep folks from seeing their truth. Acatamiento, affectionate awe, reminds me of the Acts of the Apostles where it has this one odd line and it says, and awe came upon everyone. And it suggests that the measure of health in any community at all may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. So uh, many years ago, I, I uh, was invited to speak at an in-service uh, to 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia. And it's, and I'd done this many times, and it was one of those, uh, you know, social workers commandeer a hotel ballroom, and from nine to five, you know, they, they sign up, they get credits, and they have workshops and breakout sessions and keynotes, and, and it's all about gangs, you know, you know, why do kids join gangs and what can you do about it? And I'd done many of these and I figured, you know, I'd do a keynote or something. And so I said yes and I bought my ticket. Well, a week before I was to fly, I take out the letter that originally invited me and to my horror, I discovered that I was to be the only speaker from nine to five all damn day, you know. and <laughs> and. And I said to myself what the homies, you know, often say, oh, hell no, I'm not going to be the only <laughs> speaker. So, so I invited uh, two homies, trainees, like these guys, uh, Andre, African-American gang member, and Jose, and they were like in their ninth month of their 18 months there. And I just got a text uh, from a Jose who uh, works as a social worker, oddly. And, uh, and I said, well, look, you know, uh, you're, the two of you are flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I'd like you to get up in front of 600 social workers and tell them your stories. Take your time. Because <laughs> we got a long ass day to fill. Well, I had never heard their stories, and Jose gets up first. And he's 25 years old and, uh, you know, tattooed, kind of a shot caller, been to prison. Uh, at that juncture in his halfway point with us, he, he had become a very valued member of the substance abuse team, a man solid in his own recovery, and now he's helping uh, younger homies and homegirls with... Uh, you know, their addiction issues. And, uh, and so not only had he been to prison and was a gang member, and he also, you know, had a long stretch as a, a heroin addict and an even longer stretch as a homeless man. So he gets up in front of 600 social workers and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me we didn't get along so well. I think I was six when my mom looked at me and said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasped, and he says, it sounds way worse in Spanish. <laughs> and we got friggin' whiplash going from gasp to laugh, but then he continued. I think I was nine when my mom drove me down 
to the deepest part of Baja California. And, and she walks me up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door and the guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me. And my grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school each day. First t-shirt because the blood would seep through and second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion. And he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see him. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe, affectionate awe, came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margin, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. And the measure of health in any community at all may well reside in our ability to stand in affectionate awe at what the poor have to carry rather than in judgment and if we don't welcome our own wounds, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded. And our authentic discipleship, discipleship resides in our warm heartedness in receiving the tender glance and choosing to be that in the world knowing that that's where the joy is. St. Ignatius of Loyola has a, a reflection called the two standards, and it says simply, see Jesus standing in the lowly place. And it's not supposed to indict us. Why are you not standing there? It just says, see Jesus standing there. And so... Where he chooses to stand matters because it is the place of joy and flourishing. It's the place where fearlessness can be found. It is the place where you can take seriously what Jesus took seriously. Inclusion, nonviolence, unconditional loving kindness, and compassionate acceptance. It knows where the joy is, and that's in allowing love to live through you. Yes, God is love. Yes, God is loving. But that's not how God is. That's where God is. It's not a spirituality. It's a geography. God is in the loving in a love 
that never stops loving. And that's important. So our warm-heartedness acknowledges that kindness is the only non-delusional response to everything, which is to say every other response is delusional. And so our warm-heartedness keeps us anchored to our own inner peace. And through our practice, we can take this out to the world and not only see Jesus standing there, we can join him. The homies in recovery, you know, will often say, uh, as everybody in recovery says, one day at a time. And I always say, whoa, that's way too long. You know, it's really one breath at a time. It's about choosing to cherish with every breath you take. Cherishing people is not hard. Remembering to cherish, that's difficult. Which is why we have a practice that leads us to warm-heartedness and receiving the tender glance and becoming that tender glance. You know, we have the image of Jesus in the, in the, uh, the 40 days and 40 nights, which was the precursor, you know, to Lent, which always reminds me of a homegirl, Michelle, who came into my office. She said, well, it's official. I said, what? I just found out my man's been cheating on me. I said, oh, my gosh, I'm sorry. He goes, ah, I don't sweat it. I just went to church, got me them ashes, <laughs> gave his ass up for Lent. <laughs> I, I can't say the word Lent without it triggering that story. It, has, <laughs> it advances this talk in no way at all. But, <laughs> but I think of that time, the 40 days and 40 nights, you know, and it's... it's uh, you know, we have these images of dark night of the soul, maybe anguish, doubt, a grumbling stomach. But I suspect all it was was God looking at his son and saying, you're here. You're here. And Jesus not really quite knowing what to say back except, you're here. And I think that's the singular agenda of the God we actually have. So let me end with this, and, uh, and then I'll join my compadres at the uh, table, and, and we'll engage in some questions. Um, you know, it, it occurs sometimes uh, uh, to high schools, sometimes or universities to force their students to read my books against their will <laughs> and I'm not complaining but um, and so uh, my alma mater Gonzaga there they we have a one zag in the house anyway and uh, it, it, it forced their incoming freshmen to read tattoos on the heart and they said can you bring you know two homies with you and and we'll have a huge venue a thousand people I said sure you know so uh, I made it, normally I, I, I pick enemies just to force them to share a hotel room just to mess with them. And this time I took two great friends. And, uh, and I always pick homies who have never flown before. These guys have done a few jaunts to uh, Vegas, but never this long a trip. And uh, I always pick homies who have never flown before just for the thrill to watch gang members panicked in the sky, you know. And, and so I, I picked uh, Larry, an African-American gang member, and Mario. And, uh, and I'm used to kind of nervous Nellies, and they're hyperventilating. And t but, but, but Mario was really freaking me out. It it was, he was quite uh, hyperventilating. And, it, and I'd never seen anybody do that before. And he was <laughs> <laughs> like this, you know. And, and we hadn't even boarded the plane yet, you know. And... <laughs> So we were at Burbank Airport, which is the smallest airport, and uh, they don't have that hermetically sealed chute, that bridge that you enter. 
you walk out onto the tarmac, you know, like you're the president, and, and they have the stairs that lead to the front of the plane, big feature at Burbank, stairs that lead to the back of the plane, and, and, and Mario's just freaking out, and, and Larry's off walking somewhere in the airport, and it's the first flight of the day, and it's it early morning, and, and I see two flight attendants, females, with very large cups of Starbucks coffee, and they're schlepping up the stairs to board the plane, and, and Mario goes, when are we gonna board the plane? I say, well, as soon as they sober up the pilots, um, <laughs> there, there they go now. <laughs> Perhaps I shouldn't have said that, and, um, and I thought, well, I'm gonna walk Mario uh, through the airport, maybe this will calm, calm him down, and um, I should tell you that I think in our 35-year history as an organization, Mario is the most tattooed individual who has ever worked there. So he's all sleeved out to his fingertips, neck blackened with the name of his gang, head shaved, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, chin, eyelids that say the end, so that you know when he's lying in his coffin, there won't be any doubt, I guess, for anybody. And, and so, I'd never been in public with him, so I'm walking him through the airport, and people are like this, and mothers are clutching their kids a little more closely, and I'm thinking, wow, isn't that interesting? Because if you were to go to Homeboy tomorrow and ask anybody who's the most gentle, gentle soul who works here, they'd think for a beat, and then they'd say, Mario. Yeah, Mario. Mario is proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing the world. Mario is proof that kindness is the only non-delusional response to everything. So we get to Gonzaga, and you know, the talk is at night on a Tuesday, and, and what they never tell you is that, you know, there's you know, 94 classrooms you have to visit, you know, during the course of the day. And I, so I tell these two guys, look, I'm going to talk mainly tonight, so, but you get up and tell your stories. And so they did, and they did a good job, though Mario in particular was quite terrified. But, you know, stories of terror and torture and violence and dysfunction and honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. I would not have survived a single day of either of their childhoods. And so uh, we get this big venue, a thousand people, and, and so I forced the two of them to get up and speak uh, beforehand so that I would do my thing, and then we would do Q&A. And so, um, and again, they did a good job, though they were terrified. And when it came time uh, for the uh, Q&A, I, I had them stand on either side of me, and I said, yeah, let's open it up again, a thousand people. And yes, ma'am, and a woman stands, and, and she says, uh, yeah, I got a question, it's for Mario. First question out the gate. And Mario is a tall, skinny drink of water, and he's, he's just terrified. He's clutching the microphone, and yes. And she says, well, Mario, you say you're a father, and you have a son and a daughter who are about to enter their teenage years. What wisdom uh, do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? And Mario closes his eyes, and, and he clutches the microphone, and he's starting to tremble, and he's getting a friggin' hernia trying to come up with whatever the hell he's going to say. And when suddenly he blurts out, I just... As soon as he says those two words, he rushes back to his microphone-clutching, closed-eyed refuge. But he wants to get the whole sentence out, I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence. 
until the woman who asked the question stands, and now it's her turn to cry. Why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving. You are kind. You are gentle. You are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a thousand total perfect strangers stand, and they will not stop clapping. And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hands so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had returned him to himself. But they had been returned to themselves because it's exquisitely mutual. And the room was filled with acatamiento, affectionate awe. And I think that's the only praise our exhausted God has any interest in. See Jesus standing in the lonely place. It's not about spirituality, it's about geography. It's where do we locate ourselves. You're in the right place if you're single-hearted. You're in the right place if you show mercy. You're in the right place if you're a peacemaker. But you go to the margins and they get erased because you're standing there in the lowly place where Jesus is also standing. And our stance is filled with affection and not judgment. And our stance is filled with a tenderness that resembles the tender one. And with every breath you choose to cherish, and you feel this warm-heartedness that is powerful and the mark of authentic discipleship. But the harder thing is not the better thing. It's just the harder thing. But you go and stand there because that's where the joy is, and that's where you feel fearless. And that's where the flourishing and thriving happens. Because you let love live through you. And pretty soon you cease to care if anyone accuses you of wasting your time at the margin. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, we won't take too much time, you know, maybe 15 minutes or something like that. You go like this, I go like that. I, I pass the microphone to them. Yeah, go ahead. I'll repeat the question. If Yeah, so, so the question is about uh, 
about you, not going to the margins to make a difference, to save, rescue, and fix. The other piece of that is success. So, if, so Mother Teresa says we're not called to be uh, successful, we're called to be faithful. So if, if success is the engine that drives stuff, you're going to burn out, it's going to be about you, and you just, you just won't last for the long haul. So the, the trick is not to care about success, but to care only about fidelity. So I'm going to be faithful to what a, a, a tactic, a strategy, a way of being that I believe in, and I don't, in the end, you can't care about how things turn out. It's important because at Homeboy, we're kind of reverse cherry pickers, so we want to, we take folks who nobody else wants to help, and we're endlessly telling homies, maybe this sounds familiar, but, you know, like, come back when you're ready. And that happens all the time. We love you. Come back when you're ready. Because it's about a dosing. So you, somebody gets a dose of homeboy where people see you and cherish you. And, and, and homie said to me once, you know, um, if you see me, I will always remember what I look like. It's that experience. Once you have a dose of that, it's compelling. So in the old days, if, if a homie got popped again and went to jail or relapsed or something, we would lament, oh, my God, you know, maybe he'll come back. We never say that now. We always say with absolute certainty, he'll be back, and they always come back. Because once you have a taste of what that's like to be held in a culture, in a community of a community of beloved belonging, it's, there's nothing quite like it. It's our secret sauce, I think, at Homeboy. The delivery of services is good. You know, anger management and employment of whatever and therapy, all that stuff is good and it's all secondary to the culture that welcomes. And, uh, and so you want to stay faithful to that as opposed to, uh, you know, how many homies have you saved or, you know. So we don't use that kind of language. At, at we say that transformation happens here. But nobody says, I transformed 14,000 lives or something. Nobody talks that way. Thank goodness. Next question's for them no matter what it is. <laughs> yes. Okay, so <laughs> I, 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 yes, like I, I trips and stuff like that. There you because, go. Because um, I've been on both sides of that, whether it's um, mandatory classes that we do when we get off on parole, NA systems abuse, domestic violence, anger management, um, narcotics anonymous, um, and I also been on the other side where we do both. We do therapy and all that, and then we also 
go camping. Um, just a couple months ago, we went up towards Sacramento to Lotus. Um, have never done that in my life. It was a different experience. It just helps you open up and visualize that there's other things out there than just um, trauma that we endure in our lives, you know, because none of us, I never left LA, you know. Um, therapy wise, therapy is it's good, you know. Um, I, I still, to this day, I still talk to my therapist. I talk to her in the morning, I texted her. You know, that helps me every day because, you know, um, PTSD, we have it too. But ours is more towards like gang violence. You know, it's, um, you just hear, just last week, um, I live right across the street from the, from the massacre that just happened in Monterey Park. You know, I was right there with my, with my nephews. You know, I took my nephews to go, I took my nephews right then and after that I went inside that happened, I called my therapist. You know, I'm like, hey, this is what's happening. She's like, stay relaxed, stay calm. Because to me, it's, I got it all excited. I was just like, oh, these gunshots, what's happening? What, what, how am I going to react? You know, so they taught me different forms, how to cope with things, therapy-wise and all that. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, so, me personally, um, during the, I was actually t um, talking to Father Greg earlier about this, um, that during the pandemic, I got into a lot into cooking. So, but who knew? Uh, I'm pretty good at it, you know, like, <laughs> um, so, you know, I was telling him I want to go to culinary school, and in homeboys, they they pretty much help you out with whatever you you want to do for your for your future. You know, they have all kinds of of hookups everywhere. You know, they know a lot of people. That it it extends far, so they they help you with basically anything you want to do. Um, so he said that he knows one of the what was the school that you said? Um, but yeah, I forgot, was, I forgot what was the name of the school. Well, Cordon Bleu. There you go. So, yeah, they have their they have their hands everywhere. Um, it's not just that they take you um, down one path. I mean, the main path is recovery. After that, you get to choose, you know, your own path. They just, you know, help stabilize you and, and get out into the real world. Because for us, there's not a lot of opportunities when you get out of prison and things like that. But they they help you out a lot. It just depends on what you want to do. For me, is um, I've been there on and off, like I said, for 10 years. Um, I've been through the whole system of Homeboy Industries, <laughs> from um, being in the bakery, to being, now I'm gonna be in the cafe, to being in the recy our re electronic recycling center. You know, um, me personally, I'm still working on myself. You know, um, um, I'm still gonna, still trying to get my high school diploma, even though I'm 34 years old. You know, and I push my nephews, like, stay in school, stay in school. And then to them, it's like, you tell you, you're preaching to stay in school, and, but you never did it yourself. So now I got to do it myself. You know, Homeboy Industries provides a lot of um, a lot of programs for us, you know. A lot of programs that we wouldn't be able to um, attend. Um, all the substance abuse and all that is all free. You know, sometimes mandatory court classes that are $50, $60 is all free. You know, they help us step by step, you know from working on ourselves, to getting our case managers, to navigators, to help us navigate our life because we do have problems sometimes still at this, at this point. You know, and yeah, that's what Homeboy Industry does for me on a daily basis.
Yeah, the question is about education, further education, and, and so we have a thing called Hope University. And so it's, um, the idea is that everybody be connected in some way or another with some furtherance of their education. So sometimes it's, you know, GED or high school diploma. Sometimes it's just, let's, let's help you learn how to read. And once you're finished with a high school or GED, w the expectation is that you go on to community college. So we have the hookups there. And then, you know, so we've lately, this has been an, uh, kind of an unusual thing for us, is that we have all these folks who went on to UCLA. Somebody's in law school right now. Berkeley. Uh, who? Berkeley, the one Berkeley. Berkeley. We have th three homies up in Berkeley. Um, and we had a homie who went to, you know, got his GED, and then he got, went to ELAC, East LA Community College, and then he went to Cal State LA, and he transferred to UCLA. He graduated from UCLA, and then got his MSW at UCLA, and then he came back and was a therapist at Homeboy, which was kind of remarkable uh, to see all that. And then Joanna's uh, been studying law. And so uh, that's, I hadn't seen that in my 35 years, you know, because it was, uh, you know, it, but, but we really kind of, we have a whole department uh, that kind of puts a fire under butts to make sure that folks continue to, they don't stop as long as they're with us. So the question is, how do you, how do these guys kind of convince people to, you know, because uh, I was saying earlier that, it, you know, our place doesn't exist for those who need help. It's only for those who want it. So you have to walk through the door. Uh, you know, maybe what led you through the door and how, what, what do you say to other homies? We usually, well, me personally, I usually never say nothing to nobody. It, it's just word to mouth. You know, it's, it's when, whenever we're ready, whenever we're ready to um, stop doing the things that we're doing and we're ready to change our lives, the doors are always open. You know, it, it'll, it'll always be open for us. For anybody in general, we have people that come from out of states, you know, just to come and just to, for us to help them with our program, you know, and then they'll, they'll stay there for, for years and then they ended up liking it and they become part of our senior staff, you know, so, but the doors are always open. All you gotta do is just want the help and if you seek out the help, the help will find you. you know. I would tell everybody out there just that we're worth more. You know, we grew, we grew up in an environment where to you, like, well, look, to me, like, you feel like, okay, I'm already going down this path. I'm, I really don't have a future. I'm either going to die, end up in prison, or something, you know, something bad, but you know, just, just know that you're worth more. You know, you could, there's so many things that you could do in life. And, you know, thank, thank God for Father Greg that he's given us that opportunity to be able to experience other things and, and just know our worth, you know, that we're able to take a different path now and not just the path of destruction, you know, that we've chosen. How about one, one last one, maybe? Yeah, the question is about how kind of homeboy was born or whatever. I, I was assigned as a pastor at Dolores Mission, which was quite poor, the poorest parish in the city. And it was two housing projects, not the projects that these guys uh, grew up in, but Pico Gardens and Aliso Village, the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. It had eight gangs at war with each other. And... Uh, And so the LAPD uh, called my parish the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in the whole city. So I buried my first young person as pastor in 1988. I will bury my 257th 
uh, a week from uh, tomorrow in Los Angeles, a kid who was stabbed to death. And so, and not all of them from that parish, but, you know, uh, but because I know a lot of gang members, I get asked to do this, to do their funerals. So we started the school first thing, and then we started a jobs program, and then we started uh, our first social enterprise, Homeboy Bakery. And now we have 11 social enterprises. And uh, so there are 120,000 gang members in LA County, 1,100 gangs. And I think there's probably not a single gang anywhere in the county that hasn't had members come and work at Homeboy. So, so we don't recruit, you know, people know about it. And, uh, you know, and, and it, it kind of thing in the last few years, you know, because people are starting to go to prison board after many years in prison. And so we're endlessly writing letters saying, yes, yes, you would be welcome here so that, th that they can show that at their, the prison board hearing. So uh, what was the part that, uh, how did you find? Me, um, the um, Homeboy Industries is actually located around the corner from our projects that we grew up in. So um, when they build, the, when we found out they were building the building there, um, we had f um, friends, our older homeboys that have, had been working there, had known Father Greg for a while. So they told us, hey, um, come check it out. C come see if you guys um, are interested. And the first thing we said, the first thing I said, I said, hell no, I'm not interested in this. Um, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to walk back to my neighborhood and keep on doing the same things that I was doing. Um, that didn't work so well. I ended up back in jail. Then after that, um, I went back and I told him, hey, man, like, I'm tired of this shit. I'm tired. Like, I need help. You know, I want to get better. You know, and um, after that, I've been there. He's been annoying me all my life pretty much. Yeah. I actually bumped into him on the subway. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I already knew about Homeboys um, as well for, for a while. And, but uh, just like my friend here, I just didn't want to, it wasn't for me at the time. But I paroled in out of prison in late 2019. And uh, my friend Beto here, he told me, he was like, you know, just come with us, check it out, give it a chance. And and see how it goes, and it's it's been going well, you know, so far. So, yeah, it's good. How about one last one way back there? You had your hand up. Yeah. Why don't you stand here so we can? Do they pressure you uh, about kind of hanging up your gloves and, and working at Homeboy? Why don't you try it? Do I feel pressured to go back? Um, yes, always. Um, these are not just uh, any friends. It's everyone that I grew up with. You know, I've been knowing all these people since we were little kids. Um, so I still see them. You know, I, I we still see each other all the time, but. Um, doing the same activities that we were doing is different. But I, I'll, I'll never stop talking to them. I'm just like, you know, I've been helped. I'm going to try to help them too and, you know, try to get them on a different path. But I'm not going to force to them. You know, I'm, I'm not going to force them or try to force them or try to preach to them or anything like that. It's going to be their choice just like it was mine. I could just try to nudge them that way a little bit and just leave it at that. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Greg, Greg, said, thank you all very much. And as Greg said, you are blessed when you are in the right place. And I think we were blessed because we were in the right place to get your commitment, your truth, 
and your relationships.